It is my pleasure to introduce to you John Mad Dog Hall. For those who have attended OLF year after year after year, undoubtedly know John Mad Dog Hall, but quite honestly, Mad Dog, you are my Santa Claus of Linux because you continue to, to bring us all joy and it it's a, a pleasure to hear from you always that i first got started in free and open source software and being a good new linux user through my interest in high performance computing back in 1999 and now i understand mad dog you're here to talk to us about performance for the Linux kernel in 2020. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about that. And of course, more from um, one of my favorite geek heroes of all times that I've never gotten a chance to meet and will virtually for the first time a little later this evening. Uh, Mr. Bob Young of founder of Red Hat and CEO of Lulu Press. And it will be also a pleasure to, to hear the two of you interact and catch up. So without further ado, I release the floor to you John Mad Dog Hall, tell us about performance. Thank you, Beth Lynn. Uh, I'm going to be going through this really fast and it's not to any great depth because I only have like 30 minutes or actually less now to do it. So with no further uh, ado, let's see if I can find the window. I'll share my screen. There we are. Everybody see that? Great. So performance is more than just speed, okay? Uh, for the, those of you that don't know me, this is a slide about the things I've done in the past. It's really not consequential, except for the fact I've done a lot of things and I've worked on operating systems and compilers and things like that. So I really understand a lot of the issues around performance. Recently, you start to talk to people about performance and they go, oh, CPUs are fast enough. Now I've been hearing this for like over 50 years and CPUs are never fast enough for me. I, I always need them to be faster. And then for a while, people were saying to me that Java is the only language that people need. And I would just rub my forehead on that because in lots of cases, you need something that gives you more control, more uh, control over the memory you're talking to, the IO devices you're talking to. Java is great for what it was meant for, but it is not the only language. People tell me that nobody codes an assembly language anymore. I coded an assembly language for seven years of my life as I started off in programming. And I will agree that people that write, or try and write you know, large pieces of code in assembly language, that's crazy talk. In fact, I try and get people to write as little assembly language as possible. But where assembly language comes in is reviewing the code that is produced by the compiler to see if you can make it go any faster. And finally, the people that argue with me that virtual machines make architecture knowledge obsolete. And what they're missing is the fact that typically virtual machines are talking about a virtual implementation of the operating system, but the actual code runs on the hardware itself. And so to make the code as efficient as possible still means it's going to be uh, faster and have get better performance. Uh, but a lot of people are confused when they say virtual machines, they're actually thinking about emulators. And emulators, there is this twist of one machine language into the other, and that is harder to make uh, run faster, but still a lot of the same uh, issues apply. So let's talk about what, I, what I'm talking about when I say performance. My whole life I've been dealing with what I call real problems. 
problems that have to do with petabytes of data and thousands of processors working together. Um, you, sometimes you, you say, well, my program seems to be run fast enough, but then when you try and have it address more and more data, it runs slower and slower for a variety of reasons. Another area of performance is real time. And there's soft real time and hard real time. Hard real time is typically used in control situations where you're trying to get the digital processor to try and treat an analog problem. And most of the problems of the world are, are really analog. For example, if your nuclear power plant starts to uh, burn up, starts to overheat, you want to lower those carbon rods as quickly as possible or shut down the power plant as quickly as possible. And in the meantime, if somebody is off trying to play a game, you really don't want that to be happening, right? So that's real, real time. But then you can have soft real time where as long as the problem gets done in the time frame that you wanted it, that's good enough. But still, you need to make sure it's going to be done in that time. Which brings a, a, a little story about Linus and I one time in the early days of Linux. Uh, the Linux kernel was not very good with soft real time. And I called up Linus one day, we were talking and I said something like this. He says, what do you mean it's not good? When I'm playing Quake and the monster has a gun, I shoot the monster, the monster dies, that's real time. I said, Linus, put a real gun in the hands of the monster and see what happens. He thinks for a couple of minutes, he goes, yeah, you're right. And the next release of the Linux kernel, the soft field time was much better. Cell phone apps, people say, hey, my cell phone is good enough. But in cell phones, it's a different thing that comes in. You want your battery life to last as long as possible. So performance in a lot of cases with cell phones is really how long does your battery last? Does it last throughout the day? You can also think about performance in terms of saving the environment. Let's say that Google has 10,000 servers. If you can make the applications 10% more efficient, you might be able to have need only 9,000 servers. Instead of 10 gigawatts of electricity, you may only need nine gigawatts of electricity. And so performance is very important even as you scale up. Um, then there's new things that are coming into the marketplace. We're used to the traditional CPUs and even GPUs for, for doing programming. But some of the new things that are happening are very inexpensive FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, which can run some types of applications hundreds of times faster than a traditional CPU, even at, the, at today's modern clock speeds. Digital signal processors, uh, things for doing codecs and stuff like that are also something that you might want to take a look at if you're working with uh, trying to get performance into your system. But one of the things I found out is that in order to write really great code, you need to understand how the machine works. You need to understand how the CPU works, how it holds data. You need to understand the different parts of the CPU, the CPU itself, the cache it's talking to, Inside of the CPU, you need to understand that there's registers there and how do you utilize those registers in order to get the best performance. You know, you need to, you need to think of the entire chain of moving the data off of the disk or off of the SSD, maybe off of tape drives. God help you, I don't, I don't like tape drives, but they're there. And as it flows through the computer, where do you keep the data in order to make it run the fastest? So here are some of the examples from my past. One reason for understanding assembly language or machine language is what happens when the compiler makes an error? A lot of people go, oh, compilers make an error? Sure, the compiler is a program just like your programs. And maybe the compiler writer was upstairs after a very hard weekend, comes downstairs, is scratching themselves and rubbing their head because they have a headache. And they look up at the clock and they go, oh, I have to insert my code into the into the in pool in order to meet the deadline. And so they quickly do that and they don't test it. And all of a sudden the compiler can make an error. You, the programmer, can look at your source code until the cows come home. 
But unless you can tell the compiler to generate the object code or the machine language and look at it and say, oh, this thing made a mistake, you can look at your source code and you'll never find a problem. Another example is cache. We talked about this a second ago. The fact that the CPU has registers in it, those registers typically talk to some amount of cache in the CPU. You typically have more cache in a CPU that's going for a server system than a workstation. Embedded systems sometimes have no cache at all. And then out of the cache, it talks to the main memory. And how is the memory organized? And what language are you using? And how does it hold the numbers in an array? Does it hold them in what we call column major format or row major format? Because if you now start to extract the data from the system, from the main memory, and you're attacking the data the wrong way, you could actually have a program run 40 times longer than it has to if you are extracting the data all the time out of blocks of data coming into the cache. Uh, I worked on a program one time in my early days. It was on a PDP 1170. A person wrote a program to sort 1,206 32 byte records. They wrote the program and they had the program running and it took 10 and one half hours for that computer system to sort the 1,206 records. So I looked into it, I saw what they did. They had basically done everything wrong. I changed the sort algorithm. I managed to utilize cache much better. And on the same machine with the same operating system writing in the same language, I shortened the time from 10 and a half hours to three minutes. Tape drives are notorious. I mean, these days, most of the time, we're doing with what we call streaming tape drives. But in the old days, you had start-stop tape drives. That between blocks of data, you had to have a three-quarters of an inch inter-record gap. And you also had the tape drive had to come to a complete halt before it started back up again to read the next block. If you put only one logical record in every block of data, then you might have a 20th of an inch of, of data and three quarters of an inch of a record gap. The tape drive will be starting and stopping hundreds of thousands of times. So to just move, create a greater block size meant that your program would run faster. And this again is how does the hardware really work? How does the data really pass through the program? So today, a lot of times you find, well, I was at the airport one day, I saw a student with a Harvard sweatshirt on. And I said, oh, you're going to Harvard, what are you studying? And they said, oh, we're, you know, I'm studying computer science. Oh, what are you studying? And so they said, oh, I'm studying Oracle and I'm studying Microsoft Office. And I started to find the hair sticking up in the back of my neck because I was hoping he was gonna say compiler theory and operating system design. And this is a problem that a lot of instructors in universities are stopping at a particular point and not teaching the students how the actual machines work underneath. Um, a lot of high school students, I was told by some professors at Cambridge University, they come into the university where basically they bought a laptop, they've never opened it up, they write a little bit of HTML and they think they are programmers. And so this is the way that most high school students see computers, the friendly computer, the thing that's gonna be your friend. And that's not true. They really look like this and they hate you. They know that there's users out there and they hate the users. Even something as simple as holding a number. We've all heard of ASCII numbers, okay? And it's, they're held a certain way. There's seven bit ASCII and eight bit ASCII and 16 bit ASCII, you know, and ISO codes and stuff like that. But typically you have in an ASCII code, one digit per byte. However, if you actually want to do arithmetic with it, you typically have to convert it into a different type of number, either a packed decimal number, which gives you two digits per byte and then 
a sign half nibble uh, on it, or a binary number, the strict ones and zeros, or maybe it's a floating point number. But depending on how you hold the number and how you force the compiler to hold that number, it can speed up or slow down your program dramatically if you start to use that number as an index into your array. And please don't tell me that you're holding your, your index to your array as an ASCII number. So the real life effects of dumbing down high school students coming in or university students is that the typical incoming freshman to university today knows less about computers than they knew 20 years ago when they used to use things like the Amiga or other things. And they used to pull down programs written in source code from bulletin boards. They would have to get the programs to compile on their system. They would have to get, you know, sometimes they would have uh, syntax errors in them. Sometimes they would have runtime errors and the students would go in and fix those problems. They learned how the computer worked. And so this is one of the reasons why the professors at Cambridge University invented the Raspberry Pi. They wanted a very inexpensive computer that purposely did not come with a case, purposely used an operating system that was open source. And so they started off with a $35 computer several years ago, single core ARM computer. And now today, for about the same price, you can get a four core 64 bit system, a very powerful computer that you can teach the students how to program. And there's many of these little computers and each one of them has different things that allows a student who wants to learn how an operating system works, wants to learn how really good compilers work, can experiment with for very small amounts of money. And universities, can purchase some of these and allow the students to use them. Excuse me, Mr. Mad Dog. Your, yes? your video has frozen. Would you mind restarting oh. your camera real quick? Oh yeah, but there's not there's not really I'm I'm really not too much to see. So I um... <laughs> well your freeze frame is um interesting. I think if you just restart your camera and then we can roll with it. Uh mind. yeah I'm looking for the the place on Zoom. I'm not a very big Zoom person. I'm looking for the place on Zoom to, to can can we just leave it frozen for right now, and then when I get finished with my talk, I'll. Uh, if it. that's what you want, we can do whatever you want. Okay. Thank you. So why am I showing you all this? Because of something like this. This is something I built a couple of years ago, and it's basically a bunch of you know Raspberry Pi like computers set up that would have you know 12 arm cores at that time two cores per system and total it had six gigabytes of ram it had some two terabytes of sata disk down here on the bottom that you could set up raid of different types and then it had a uh, switch that would allow you to basically set up a, um, a beowulf type of system now today because the Raspberry Pi has moved on, you can have 24 ARM cores in it. You can have up to 48 gigabytes of RAM if you buy the eight gigabyte uh, Raspberry Pis. And it, a very, very powerful system that can be disassembled and put into a standard side briefcase and reassembled again, you know, wherever you're going. And why is this interesting? Because with this little system or set of systems here, uh okay i'm going to try and start my video because something has popped up here in the middle no it's not doing that um why is this interesting because you can do high performance computing you can do high availability computing you can do heterogeneous computing if you put different operating systems on each one and it is portable and not that expensive so if you're looking at GNU Linux and you're thinking about programming for the future, then you could take a look at Beowulf supercomputers and think about how you can use the non-uniform memory architecture of the Beowulf supercomputers to solve really big problems. 
Um, there's a lot of people out there that are trying to build these high performance computers out of Raspberry Pi zeros. And I question that because the amount of CPU it takes to transfer the data between systems is almost, almost eats up the entire Raspberry Pi zero. But certain of the newer Raspberry Pis that have more cores and more memory would probably be relatively uh, good to do that. Take a look at how you program GPUs, not just for graphics, but to be able to tr handle large amounts of data in parallel for various types of problems. Learn about field programmable gate arrays. Lena says that if he wasn't, if he was starting over again today, he might not do an operating system. Instead, he might be able to, he might look at field programmable gate arrays, how to program them. They're very interesting. And I really hope that I retire or maybe even die before quantum computing comes in because I don't really want to have to deal with it, but it's out there and we should start taking a look at it and seeing how we can program using quantum computing. So the summary of my whole talk is that I recommend even in this day and age that people learn some type of assembly or machine language. It doesn't have to be a complex one. You can take a look at things like, uh, well, obviously the Intel assembly language and machine language is, is very prominent, but it's also very complex. If you take a look at a RISC type of assembly or machine language, like a RISC-V, it has the same type of capabilities and, and issues and problems and insights as a more complicated assembly language does. But just learning how the assembly language works and how the machine actually works below will help you with your programming. Choose your algorithms and data carefully. You know, think about it because yes, we have good optimizing compilers today, but you can still make them work better if you think about your problem ahead of time and help them with uh, pieces of information that let them generate the, their code better. Use the right language for the right job. You know, even today, I mean, I will admit that C isn't the most friendly language in the world. But if you're writing something in a kernel, C still has a lot of good features for it. Take a look at Rust, take a look at Go. They're also up and coming languages. Examine the assembly language that is generated by your compiler and see if you can reduce the number of instructions or the types of instructions which it's using. Sometimes, Fewer instructions actually take longer, particularly in Intel assembly language, because the Intel assembly language is a complex instruction set machine. And sometimes their instructions do a lot of, spend a lot of clock cycles in doing something. If you program on a RISC computer, generally speaking, the greater the number of instructions that you generate, the longer it takes and the smaller amount the faster it goes. When you're doing speed ups, you know, you could say, okay, I'm making my program two to three times faster, and that's great. But, you know, there comes a time where you say, that's good enough. I'm not going to waste any more of my time trying to make the program any more efficient. And so you stop and you go on to the next problem. If you're interested in resources, uh, these are some uh, resources about GCC and how it works. They're still very good today, even though they're a little old. Um, taking a look at debugging with the open source tools and being able to analyze with profiling. Uh, if you're interested in ARM assembly language, this book is very good for ARM. So with that, this is the end of my talk. I will stop sharing my screen. Oh, hi, Mad Dog. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Hopefully we can get you back on video momentarily. Hello, hello. That I love the freeze frame and the thumbs up motion though. That's perfect. <laughs> Beth, Beth Lynn.
All right, did you go away too? Okay, now I have camera access. I'm high fiving whoever is coming okay. over. Up, oh, just kidding. Can you high five me from the? Well, I guess your view is different, so that wouldn't work. I'm just I'm just patting your head instead. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that kids in the hall skit where it's like I'm, I'm your squishing head. your head. I'm crushing your head. I'm crushing that uh, white toy behind you. Crushing your head. <laughs> I'm crushing your head. Yeah, that kids in the hall, man. That's really old school. <clears throat> Well, I think he left. Did he leave for real, real? We had questions. The Zoom was popping off with questions. Oh, he, he definitely has questions for our, our next very special guest of honor, which is Bob Young. And um, the two of them go back quite a bit in the early days of Red Hat Inc. specifically how to get the hardware platforms on board with the free software operating mm. that was being reintroduced into the ecosystem and it it was something that I understand turned into be I don't know, the most successful business model in open source, if not technology. So <laughs> I, I think we're safe to say at this point in history that it was a good idea to ship free software on all sorts of microprocessors. And I'm really glad to have heard from John Mad Dog Hall today discussing all sorts of processors that are available for um, your use on the Linux kernel in 2020. Absolutely. Fabulous, fabulous work. Uh, did Mad Dog rejoin us? I rejoined you. Where did you, where did you lose me or where did I lose you? <laughs> Um, you you made it all the way to the end, and oh, but you you got permanently stuck in a thumbs up position. So I don't know if you planned that, but if you did, I am impressed. <laughs> There's some questions actually. Do we have time, or are we in a four panel like debate right now? <laughs> well, I think this is the time that Bob is supposed to join uh, the session. I think he joins at uh, five forty five. Yeah, you guys could both yeah. answer the questions, or you could fight about it. It's too, it's up to you. Uh, can you guys hear me? I've, I've unmuted oh. myself. Okay, great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Virtual hugs for Bob Young. Uh, you are amazing, man. It, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. So don't uh, kid yourselves. It's my great. Uh, honor and pleasure to be invited to your uh, uh, your well-established and very important conference. Yeah, you you did it. Good job. <laughs> there we go. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, and, and what, uh, uh, Beth, you can speak to this one. I've been hounded by the Ohio Linux uh, group for 10 years. And I very rudely turned you down every year. And so it's a great pleasure to be here tonight. <laughs> oh, uh, no, I, I completely understand that you had priorities, man, with the, the Canadian football team that you own. That, that's outstanding that you're, you're living your boyhood dreams. And I, I couldn't possibly <laughs> take that away from anyone. Well, the, the real highlight of my day these days, I'm an early stage entrepreneur guy. So the smaller the business, the happier I am. And uh, the most fun I'm having is actually with my wife's needlepoint business. It turns out, it turns out you lock America's women in their houses and they want two things. They want toilet paper and needlepoint. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, Bob, I'm going to object to that because I will have you know that there are many men who also do needlepoint. Uh, th that is true, that Mad Dog, and I'm, I'm. If you aren't one of them, I will, uh, I will turn you into one in, in due course. 
Oh, wonderful. Is there a brand behind this Needlepoint class? Like, is there a name for the company? Is it a company, company or is it? it yeah, the company actually started in 99. Uh, we were able to buy the URL needlepoint.com. There you uh, go. So we've actually called it needlepoint.com ever since. That is the brand. Oh, wow. And, uh, you can't and forget for, it. For the first uh, 15 years, we didn't do any business on the internet. Uh, needle pointers are typically uh, people who are uh, sort of retired from either their job or raising kids. And so, you know, in, in the year 2000, 50 year olds hadn't really used the internet. Mm. Today, 50 year olds were 35 years old in 2000, <laughs> and they've been using the internet ever since. So now they retire or their kids leave home and they want to take up Needlepoint, where do they go? They go to needlepoint.com. Uh -huh. I wonder during today's times if you've seen a surge in Needlepoint. That's exactly visits. my point. <laughs> exactly my point. Uh, us and the toilet paper manufacturers are having a very good year. Um, oh, we have a question. Uh, would you like to read the Zoom questions? I feel like you you, sh you got those, right, Beth? I think it's a sure, worthwhile sure. endeavor. I'll, I'll read them. They're, they're for Mad Dog. Do you have suggestions for the patterns and paradigms beyond K and R? Oh, there's lots of books out there on performance. And a lot of the a lot of the performance issues are somewhat language dependent, that the different languages hold the data in different ways, and the different languages have different ways of specifying data. So I don't really have, I mean, just looking for books on computer performance, I think would be a better thing to go than a specific uh, a specific paradigm. I, I I know that there, I remember one book that was very good about uh, using Fortran for doing multi-threaded programming, and it told you how to set up your algorithms in Fortran so that it was easier to spread your uh, use multiple threads going across your Fortran programs. So, you know, I, I don't really have any off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Are, are the slides being shared anywhere? That's a big one because the book recommendations flew by for people and they were like, huh? I sent a copy of my P a PDF of my slides to OOF Wonderful. a couple of days ago. So if you'd like to put them up on your site, please do. Give them more work. That's a great. Right on the schedule. Oh, that's good. Okay. <laughs> so there's another Zoom question for Bob. Have you considered one day sponsoring a Canadian curling team from Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this might this might have like someone may have a vested interest. In it. <laughs> so uh, the short answer is uh, no. I'm not a curler, and uh, I'm. Uh, but uh, I'll have to look into it, Jeff. <laughs> so send. Send me a note to Bob at Lulu.com and I'd be happy to have the conversation. Perfect. Oh man. Do you, Bob, do you have a nickname? Mad Dog has a nickname. People want to know what how Mad Dog got his nickname. Do you have one? Maybe uh, you can so, both share stories. So I have a lot of nicknames. Most of them are not polite enough to share on your on your. <laughs> but uh, I go by with the tiger cats, and, and this is an interesting one because I think of it in exactly the same way in at Red Hat. Uh, uh oh, <laughs> he we'll froze. Give him a second. We'll give him a second. <laughs> I like your reaction, though, Mad Dog. Oh, he's back. Yeah. You're and, back. And yeah. So the the concept is that. You know, I don't have a, I'm not a smart guy like Mad Dog. So, so my role here uh, is really just to try and communicate to the world the value uh, in, in going the story around open source, the value of what the open source community was doing uh, because the world didn't understand it when you tried to explain it in terms of source code versus binary. Right. So my job as an old typewriter salesman was to articulate <laughs> it in terms that non 
techie people could actually understand. And, and uh, that's, that's where the nickname, I think, started. Uh, and um, anyway, so, so there you go. If, if, uh, and my handle on um, Twitter is Caretaker Bob, for example. Ah, interesting. I want to point out that there were only three people who could never call me Mad Dog. Uh, Donnie Barnes, who was one of the people who helped to start Red Hat, and Bob, who was the second person, and he just could never call me Mad Dog. There's actually a third person, John. Your mother. I was about to add her. No, oh. I was about to add her. <laughs> Okay. Unfortunately, mom died a number of years ago, so there's only two yeah. left, Bob. Oh, okay. I hope, yeah. I hope you go on for many years. So, it, it, and the problem that uh, so let me start with the first story here of uh, and answer your questions about how Mad Dog and I met, which was uh, I had stumbled into this open source play, uh, was actually starting to think that I might be able to to bet my kids' college education on this thing. Uh, but Mark Ewing and I were still funding it out of our own credit card, you know, credit card debt. I would sign up for another credit card whenever I had another bill to pay. Uh, and all of a sudden, we get a call from an executive at Digital Equipment Corporation. And we're going, holy cow, billion is, dollars. Is that uh, deck? Yeah. Do they call it deck? Dollars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Deck or digital uh, are, are interested in what we are doing. And of course, that executive was was uh, John Hall or Mad Dog Hall. And, and uh, I was so impressed that a guy with zero backing from anywhere upstairs at digital, like it, uh, Mad Dog did this all by himself. And he did it with zero support from anyone at, the, at digital. Uh, but yet he found resources at digital to support not only what we were doing, but many other open source projects. Uh, and you just got to love a guy who works for a big corporation whose salary is on the line for making mistakes or, you know, not doing what his boss says, who doesn't care what his boss says and steals <laughs> from his corporation in order to make this movement move faster than it would have without digital support. Uh, and this because wasn't of that, stealing, Bob. This wasn't the, stealing. I, I it was an investment. Term, I use stealing with all the respect in the world. I, right. I, I, as an entrepreneur, I steal stuff as often. Anything that isn't tied down is, is very Borrow. Easy. Borrow, Bob. The word's borrow. You know you're going to pay Borrow is back. a good word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can see why you're excited for this, Beth. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. Share alike was the whole yeah. uh, value of uh, the GPL. It was. Yes. So it, it, do you want a story, uh, uh, Beth? What, what's the Absolutely. format now? Should, story time. Should, should we share launch and it? Share alike. Story? Because that, that's what this session is all about. Mad Dog and I are just going to re relive some old stories. Hopefully, if we pick the right ones, they are stories that actually still resonate today. And that uh, whoever is listening to us might find some insight in what they are trying to do with, uh, with ours. Um, uh, John's, by the way, and, and coming back to that story about John's willingness to borrow resources at digital uh, for the greater good of, of the open source at the time, the free software community, um, is actually really, really good career advice for anyone working in a large corporation. If you spend all your time worrying about how to protect your salary, Uh -oh. I feel like we should, then you won't have enough time to think about the actual goal that you're trying to go to. Is this a test to see if we're paying attention? <laughs> well, and you'll miss opportunities, okay? Yeah. You'll miss opportunities. And while we're waiting for Bob to come back, <laughs> um, I will add uh -oh. that some of my, some of the things I was doing was calling in favors that other people owed me from times that I had done them favors 
okay because that's a lot of ways to get stuff done right. that people people that you've helped in the past now come back and you say this is a great idea would you know would you help me with this and a lot of the, a lot of the stuff in companies is is done that way yeah Bobby, you true. back with us yes i am okay I selfishly, I selfishly want to ask that your first experience with Linux, because I think it would be really an amazing story, but I also know there's a presentation to be done. So I leave it up to you, Beth, to decide what we're going to do 